Part three, chapters four and five of the Mysteries of Marseille by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four, in which Monsieur de Cazalis runs the risk of losing his head while losing his great nephew. Monsieur de Cazalis had fallen asleep downstairs in a sitting room under Blanche's bedroom in this drowsy state it had several times seemed to him that he heard people walking about overhead a more distinct sound ended by awakening him with a start he stood up full of distrust and went to make sure whether he had been dreaming or not but all he feared was that blanche might have risen to write a letter and thus inform her friends outside of what had occurred it never entered his head that some one could have penetrated within the house for he had kept an eye on the front door like a watchdog he went upstairs determined to see what his niece was doing as he heard nothing moving he gently pushed the door open and cast a look around the room by the pale glimmer of the night-light he perceived blanche with her eyes closed and her face half hidden by the bedclothes apparently in a heavy sleep encouraged by the silence he resolved to be quite sure by making a minute inspection of the apartments he first of all searched the dressing-room and found nothing suspicious he returned to the bedroom and there was nothing there he was already smiling at his childish alarm when a thought flashed across his mind and he suppressed an exclamation he had not seen the child although he had already peered into every corner he renewed his search he brutally shook the bed without blanche opening her eyes and it did not even occur to him from this circumstance that she was feigning slumber his mind was a prey to the most excruciating agony and in despair he ended by moving round like a wild beast having but one idea that of finding the new-born babe at any cost in his anxiety he stooped down and looked under the articles of furniture imagining his niece had hidden her son somewhere to make him afraid and drive him mad for nearly a quarter of an hour he ferreted about in a fury returning to the same spot ten times over unable to believe the dreadful truth when he was tired when he had acquired the certitude that the child was neither in the bedroom nor dressing-room he went and stood before the bed where blanche was lying exhausted and motionless he gazed in a stupid manner round the room where the little one had been when he had last left his niece and repeated methodically he was there and is there no longer these words found a painful echo in his brain at first he did not think of seeking a solution to this strange disappearance he saw only the fact and his fright showed him in a flash all the consequences of that fact all his calculations were baffled blanche's heir was no longer in his hands and he would be compelled some day or other to give him a statement as to what he had done with his mother's money that meant shame and misery it would be ascertained that he had already made an inroad into his niece's fortune and they would take away from him the riches which alone upheld his power the frightful blow was the forerunner of a series of reprisals he had no doubt as to the hand that had dealt it he recognized the vengeance of the cayoles and he was in terror at the thought that these people had now his honour at their command he saw that he was at their mercy and that they could inflict most terrible chastisement on him for his pride what irritated him above all was failing at the last moment a few hours longer and philippe's son would have been placed beyond reach of the cayoles he felt that if he had not given way to blanche's tears the child would already have been far away this thought reminded him of all the precautions he had taken and he said to himself that a clever plan had never so miserably failed little by little he became angry and gave way to blind irritability at seeing himself duped in this cruel way then he tried to understand how the child had been carried off and this mental investigation increased his anger he understood that his niece must have had a hand in the conspiracy and had half a mind to beat her what have you done with him he inquired in a gruff voice blanche had been trembling between the sheets ever since her uncle had entered the room she kept her eyes obstinately closed in order that she might not see him and also to delay the scene she foresaw was coming she listened with terror to the sound of his footsteps she followed him in his fruitless search and in a measure as the crisis drew nearer she trembled more violently and became still more icy cold when he came and stood beside the bed and examined her motionless dumb with stupor she imagined he was reflecting on the means of putting an end to her existence his loud voice made her open her eyes but her throat was dry thick with agony what have you done with the child 
Monsieur de Cazalis asked again in a stifled voice. She stammered, but was unable to pronounce a single word. Then her uncle accused and reviled her with brutal rage. "'You are not of my blood,' he exclaimed. "'I disown you. I ought to have left you in the hands of that blackguard who carried you off. You are a worthy companion for him. What? You go in league with our enemies. You distrust me and prefer to confide your child to that family of tatterdemalions? Don't deny it. I see it all. Look here. You are a vile creature. After having dishonoured our name, you do not flinch from placing us at the mercy of your lover. Oh, I was wrong. I ought to have seen that you had a filthy heart and should not have meddled with this dirty business. I hope they'll make a rascal of your son, a scoundrel like themselves, a beggar who'll come one of these days begging at our door and whom I'll drive away. He spoke thus for a quarter of an hour, a prey to the fury that blinded him and which prevented him perceiving the stupidity of his behaviour. He showed no respect for anything, drenched his niece with foulness, wounded her so deeply that she rose up trembling powerful with courage in her indignation and grief if he had contented himself with being imperious and cold she would have shewn weakness and have given him other arms against her but as he was coarse she became strong and answered him firmly you have guessed aright sir i have handed my son to those to whom he belongs i am not obliged to give you the reasons that prompted me in my conduct and i tell you at this moment you are outstepping any rights you may have over me however you know i have come to a resolution as soon as i have recovered i shall take the veil we shall be strangers to each other cease then reviling me but why would you not leave me this child whom i would have loved as a son continued her uncle who with difficulty restrained himself i acted according to the dictates of my heart she continued do not question me i cannot answer you i am willing to forget your abuse and to thank you for having watched over my childhood that is all i can do you have nearly killed me now leave me m de cazalis understood that he had gone too far he was afraid that his niece might guess the reason of his anger this thought troubled him and suddenly calmed his irritation he could not however resist speaking to her on a dangerous subject there are accounts between us he stammered which must be settled do not let us talk of that blanche answered excitedly i have neither the strength nor the inclination to busy myself with such matters as i have told you i am dead to the world i shall require nothing in the future as to my son he will apply to you later on and set forth his claims if he chooses to do so i have left his interests in honest hands only i must warn you that those of whom you spoke so brutally a little while ago are decided on acting in case you oppose my wishes now for mercy's sake leave me blanche fell back on the pillow satisfied at having conquered and went to sleep peacefully m de cazalis hesitated for a moment and then finding nothing to add withdrew the misfortune that had just happened was irreparable but he still preferred the peril in the distance to an immediate explanation children do not grow up in a day and he calmed his feelings of uneasiness with the thought that he would have plenty of time to set his house in order later on when the mother had taken the veil he could institute a search for the son and obtain possession of him he knew philippe had fled to italy and he concluded from that that the new-born babe had been handed to the fugitive's brother it was therefore against marius that he thought of directing his operations in the meanwhile he went to paris to fulfil his duties as deputy he thus avoided acting rashly and could consider at leisure the plan he proposed to pursue chapter five in which blanche bids farewell to the world blanche was three weeks in bed between life and death the great strain her nerves had undergone on the evening her child was born brought on a fever which nearly carried her off during these three weeks of agony abbe chastanier and fine were at her bedside m de cazalis on leaving had dismissed madame lambert who was henceforth useless and the cottage was once more open to the flower-girl there was no guardian to watch the invalid her uncle having been contented to place her in the hands of the old priest in the sincere hope that on his return to marseilles he would find her buried in some convent blanche little by little recovered the tender and devoted care of which she was made the object the bitter healthy sea-breeze that came in freely at her windows obliged her to live in spite of her secret desire to die and thus leave the world where she had already suffered so much pain 
when the doctor told her she was saved she turned her great sad invalid's eyes towards fine and said to her with a feeble smile i should have been so comfortable in the earth but it was not to be i must continue suffering please not to go on like that exclaimed the young girl the dead feel cold in the earth you may be sure love do good and you will have a long life of happiness before you and she passionately kissed mademoiselle de cazalis who answered in a softer tone you are right i forgot that i could work to lessen the misery of the unfortunate and thus secure some comfort for myself the period of convalescence was not long blanche was soon able to get up and drag herself to the window there she passed her time in a consoling contemplation of the great sea which spread out in its apparent infinity before her all invalids should go and get cured beside the blue waters of the mediterranean for its calm immensity has a tranquil majesty about it that appeases pain it was on a clear morning beside the open window with her eyes lost on the bluish horizon that blanche spoke out plainly to abbe chastanier of her firm intention to take the veil my father she said i am gaining strength every day and as the life of this world is not suitable for me i desire as soon as i am well that my first steps may take me to god my daughter answered the priest this decision is a grave one before binding yourself with everlasting bonds i ought to remind you of the good things you are leaving it is useless interrupted the young woman excitedly my resolution is irrevocable you are familiar with all the reasons that urge me to affiance myself to heaven you yourself have pointed divine love out to me as the only refuge against the human love by which i have been crushed do not treat me as a child i beg of you look on me as a woman who has suffered a great deal and desires to atone for her cowardice confess it my father there are no earthly advantages comparable to the tranquillity of one's spirit and if i succeed in tasting the joys of pardon i shall not regret the mundane satisfaction to which i renounce so willingly do not prevent me going to god abbe chastanier bowed his head blanche spoke in such a deep and troubled voice that he understood heavenly grace had touched this poor child and that it would be wrong to deprive her of the sweets of abnegation i did not wish to raise a discussion as to my resolution continued the convalescent in a calmer voice i desired to consult you as to the religious order i ought to choose as i told you i feel strong and in a week i must leave this beach every rock on which reminds me of my short life of grief and passion i have already reflected on the choice you might make answered the priest and i have thought of the carmelite order are not the carmelites cloistered yes they lead a contemplative life they kneel to god and implore him to pardon the world they are the daughters of ecstasy your place is among them you are weak you need to forget to place an impenetrable barrier between you and your youth i advise you to shut yourself up in the innermost recesses of the cloister far from mankind and to live in earnest prayer full of forgiveness and celestial peace blanche gazed at the great sea the priest's words had brought tears to her eyes after a silence she murmured as if speaking to herself no no it would be cowardice to seek for calm in that way to slumber in ecstasy it would be a sort of divine egotism and i will have none of it i wish to earn my pardon by working with my hands and heart for the good of the unfortunate if i cannot watch over my child i will watch over those of poor mothers who are without bread i feel that at such a sacrifice only shall i be happy there was another silence then taking the abbe's hand and gazing in his face she added my father can you procure my admission among the sisters of st vincent paul those whom they term the sisters of the poor abbe chastanier protested saying she was too delicate that she would not be able to stand up against the fatigue that these saintly creatures endure in the hospitals orphanages everywhere where there are services to be rendered to the suffering and forlorn do not be alarmed exclaimed blanche in a transport of self-sacrifice i shall be strong in order to earn my forgiveness i can only accept the chalice of labour if i do not make myself useful i shall never forget i have a last request to make to you let me be placed in an orphanage i shall fancy myself the mother of all those little creatures entrusted to my care i will cherish them as i would have my own child she wept 
she spoke with such transports of affection that abbe chastanier was obliged to give way he promised to take the necessary steps and a few days later he announced to blanche that her wishes would be realized besides he considered the young woman's decision very natural her spirit which was full of blind devotion had been formed to understand extreme abnegation he wrote to m de casalis who answered him in terms of perfect indifference that his niece was free and that whatever she decided on would be satisfactory at the bottom of his heart he was delighted to see her enter a poor and modest order that was not so rapacious for dowries as some of the others on the evening of the day preceding that on which mademoiselle de casalis was to leave the cottage she appeared quite uneasy and embarrassed in abbe chastanier's presence fine who was there pressed her with questions as to the cause of this sudden sadness she ended by falling on her knees before the priest and saying to him in a trembling voice my father i am not yet dead to the pleasures of this world i should like to see my son for the last time before belonging entirely to god the abbe hastened to raise her from the ground go he answered her go where your heart calls you and learn that you do not offend heaven by giving way to your tenderness heaven loves those who love that is all the christian doctrine blanche who was quite troubled hastened to get ready pine was to take her to her child and both of them soon went out from the day the infant had been born they had both avoided speaking of the poor little creature the flower-girl had simply set the young mother's mind easy by saying he was in safety and well and had all possible care when pine and marius found themselves in possession of the new-born babe they returned in the cabriolet to marseilles the next morning they played a most audacious game by taking the child to st barnabé and giving him to the wife of the gardener ayes thinking that m de casalis would never seek him there it was to st barnabé then that vine took blanche when the latter caught sight of the gardener's cottage with the great mulberry trees spreading their branches before the entrance when she saw the stone bench on which she had been seated with philippe all the past flew back to her memory and she burst out sobbing barely a year had gone by and yet it seemed as if centuries of suffering separated the hour of her first love from the present she could still see herself hanging round her lover's neck without a care and hoping for a future full of happiness and at the same time she saw herself disconsolate her heart bleeding so broken that she was on the point of renouncing the pleasures of her eighteen summers she was choking with intense bitterness when she reflected that a few months had sufficed to take her from those hopes of happiness which are burning in the hearts of all the young girls to the dark thoughts of remorse which weigh on the minds of penitence blanche had come to a standstill before the gardener's door trembling with emotion not daring to enter fearing to meet philippe's ghost in this cottage where he had fondled her fine who perceived her trouble dispelled her fright and calmed the fever of her memory by calmly saying to her come go in you will find your son there blanche darted into the house her son she thought would defend her against the past as soon as she had taken three steps in the first room which was spacious countrified and full of smoke she found herself before a cradle she bent over the infant who was sleeping in it and contemplated him for a long time without awakening him the gardener's wife seated near the door was knitting a stocking and singing a sweet slow provencal air in an undertone blanche kissed the baby's forehead in the twilight she wept and her tears awoke the child who put his little arms forward with a vague complaint the mother felt her heart fail her did not her duty call her to this cradle had she the right to take refuge in the bosom of god but she was afraid of giving way to a yearning she had not avowed to mad hopes then she said to herself that she had sinned and would be punished she thought she heard a voice crying to her your punishment will be to be deprived of the caresses of your child and she ran away sobbing after having covered the face of the little creature she was to see no more with kisses henceforth the young woman was dead to all love but that of god she had just rent in twain the last link that attached her to the world this final crisis freed her of her own flesh and blood she became all spirit on returning to marseilles she handed fine the documents establishing the identity of her son and the following day left for a small town in the department of the va where she entered an orphanage in accordance with the wish she had expressed End of chapters four and five
part three chapters six seven and eight of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six a spectre two years had passed in the first months of them marius married fine and took a small flat on the cour bonaparte m martelli who put his signature to the marriage contract endowed the bridegroom by taking him into his business he was no longer a clerk but a partner who brought his intelligence and zeal with him in lieu of capital fine on her side left her kiosk on the cour st louis so as to be able to give her whole attention to her household but as she wished to continue earning her living she made artificial flowers in her spare moments and was so nimble with her fingers that her work looked almost natural sometimes however when people complimented her on her ability she sighed thought with regret of her fresh sweet-smelling nosegays of other days and answered ah but if you saw the roses of the good god these two years were twenty-four months of peaceful happiness the young household lived like birds in a warm secluded nest of moss days followed days one as happy as the other full of delightful monotony and the pair would have liked this sort of life to go on for ever each hour bringing back to them the same kisses and the same joys in the morning marius left for his office fine placed herself before a small table twisting the stalks crumpling the petals and deftly producing delicate muslin flowers with her agile fingers then of an evening they both went out for a walk along the noisy streets and reached the seashore near andoum they had discovered a corner among the rocks there where they seated themselves alone facing the blue immensity night set in and they gazed with emotion at the great sea which had betrothed them at st henri in the old days it was thus they came to thank it and to seek in its deep voice an air suitable for their love when they returned the bonds of their affection were drawn even closer than before every sunday they had a day in the country which was spent at st barnabé setting out in the early morning and returning late at night the visit they paid to the child of blanche and philippe was a sort of pilgrimage for them but apart from that they enjoyed themselves there under the mulberry trees at the door the warm country air filled them with lively gaiety they had enormous appetites and recovered all the turbulency of youth whilst he talked to the gardener she gambled on the floor with the baby amid peals of laughter and all sorts of charming foolishness in accordance with the desire expressed by blanche they had acted as godfather and godmother to her son and had given him the name of joseph when joseph called the young woman mamma she sighed and clasped him in her arms for she loved him as if she had really been his mother joseph was growing up charming and refined like a child of love he could already walk alone and lisp a few words in that delightful prating of the baby age for the moment marius and fine confined themselves to loving him fondly later on they would see to making a man of him they said and to assuring him the position to which he was entitled but the young household were not so wrapped up in their own enjoyment as to forget the fugitive that poor philippe who was living alone and disconsolate in italy his brother had been taking active steps to obtain his pardon so that he might return to marseilles and begin life again a life of work unfortunately the obstacles were numerous and he encountered a stubborn resistance that put his most energetic efforts to naught however he did not despair of success and felt even sure that one day or other he would attain his end in the meantime he confined himself to exchanging a few letters with philippe urging him to be courageous and above all not to give way to his craving to return to france if he were guilty of that imprudence all might be lost philippe answered that he was at the end of his tether and was dying of weariness this despair and impatience alarmed marius who went so far as to invent untruths to keep the fugitive in exile he promised him he would have his pardon in a month then when the month was at an end he assured him it would certainly be for the following month and for more than a year he had in this way made him take patience one sunday evening just as fine and marius had returned from st barnabé their neighbors informed them that a man had called to see them several times in the course of the afternoon as they were retiring for the night after having vainly endeavored to think who this strange visitor could be they heard a slight knock at their door marius who opened it was stupefied what you he exclaimed in despair fine hastened to join him and recognized philippe who after having embraced them both answered yes it is i i should have died over there i was obliged to return at any price what folly continued marius quite upset i was certain of your pardon but now i will not answer for anything 
go along with you i will keep in hiding until you have succeeded i could not live away from you from my child any longer i was absolutely ill but why not have advised me i would have taken some precautions ah but if i had told you of my intention you would have persuaded me not to return to marseilles i have done a headstrong thing but you who are a sensible man will repair everything and turning to fine he said eagerly how is my little joseph then the danger the fugitive ran was forgotten after the surprise and dissatisfaction of the first few moments came the unbosoming of their hearts a long affectionate conversation which was prolonged until three o'clock in the morning philippe related his misfortunes and sufferings in exile here and there he had given french lessons for a livelihood avoiding staying long in any one place and living alone and unknown when he had related in detail all he had gone through his brother who was deeply moved avoided reproaching him with his return on the contrary he racked his brain to find a means of hiding him at marseilles so that he could await his pardon and be near his child marius first of all insisted on philippe being shaved a performance that completely changed the young man's appearance then he made him dress in a coarse suit of clothes and found a place for him as stevedore with cadet his wife's brother who had succeeded sauveur it was understood that cadet would allow philippe to loiter about the port without making him do any work but after the second day the improvised stevedore begged for some employment to help him to pass his time and he was placed at the head of a squad of workers things remained thus for several months marius expecting from day to day to obtain his brother's liberty as to philippe he was quite happy every evening he went to st barnabé and the pleasure he found there playing with his son helped him to forget his troubles he had already been a year at marseilles when one evening on reaching the gardener's cottage he fancied he saw a tall thin man behind him who had been following him from the port but little joseph's merry welcome soon made him forget the incident had he turned his head the next day he would have found the same tall thin man following and watching him again chapter seven monsieur de cazalis yearns for joseph during the three years that had elapsed since the birth of the son of blanche and philippe important changes had taken place in the existence of m de cazalis he had not been re-elected deputy at the last elections and had come to reside at marseilles his defeat due to the unpopularity he had earned among the people owing to his quarrels with the cayoles did not seem to affect him a great deal the truth was that he preferred attending to his own affairs rather than to those of his country he had enough cares at home enough work to do to parry the blows with which he was threatened without troubling himself with a mandate that would rivet him to paris for several months in a year he took up his abode at his mansion on the cour bonaparte and acted in such a manner as to make himself forgotten by the whole city he gave up going out in his carriage and splashing the peaceful tradesmen he did his best to pass unperceived and succeeded so well that in a short time he was quite unknown to most people his dream was to secure his peace of mind as soon as possible and then proceed to paris and devour his niece's fortune in grand style if he led the sad and retired life that he did it was because his instinct of prudence urged him to study the position and secure immunity before laying a finger on what did not belong to him he had a mad desire to satisfy himself at once but was afraid he was willing enough to despoil blanche on condition he would never be branded as a thief when he had succeeded in being forgotten when he was shut up in his mansion like a simple bourgeois fond of retirement and silence he planted his batteries he found himself in the centre of the intrigue he meant to direct and was in hopes that by his nonchalant attitude he had dispelled the distrust of his adversaries at the bottom of his heart his most ardent desire was to discover the whereabouts of his niece's boy and obtain possession of him then only would he be able to grasp the fortune that was lying idle in his hands but by an effort of hypocrisy he was able to restrain himself for nearly three years he remained quiet without appearing to take any steps to find out where his great-nephew was hidden and in reality he did not risk a single attempt being faithful to his plan of feigned indifference the result of this comedy was to tranquillize marius the young man had imagined that the day after the babe had been carried off m de cazalis would have flown into a rage scoured marseilles and searched everywhere else to find him he was first of all very much surprised at the indifference of blanche's uncle and suspected that it served to hide some trap then little by little his suspicions were dispelled and he dozed away in happy confidence until at length he thought no more of this man who was hiding in obscurity in order to watch his prey the better 
if m de casalis was patient and made no researches it was because he knew the cayolles could not make use of the child against him for some time he permitted them to bring it up counting on stealing it when it became dangerous to leave it in their hands so long as philippe did not return to france so long as his son had not attained a certain age marius had his hands tied it was impossible for him to create a scandal that might turn against his own brother to tell the truth m de casalis placed great reliance on the upright and just mind of marius in order to bring his own affairs to a happy issue he said to himself that the young man would never venture to compromise blanche and that he would sooner abandon the fortune than to do so in any case he had at least five years tranquillity before him but if he relied on the virtues of marius he was in absolute terror when he thought of philippe he felt that if he ever fell into the latter's hands he would meet with no mercy he knew the violence the energetic nature of the fugitive and considered him a man who would stop at nothing when it was a question of satisfying a hatred or a vengeance so he took certain precautions to shelter himself from that hatred in case philippe returned to france he earnestly desired to see him commit that imprudence and rather for the pleasure of having him arrested than to escape his vindictiveness he employed a certain Matthäus, a rascal who was devoted to him to go to italy and keep at the young man's heels so as to return with him in case he took it into his head to embark the spy acquitted himself faithfully of his mandate he found philippe at genoa and from that moment never left him when the latter returned to marseilles Matthäus was on the same steamer but by chance lost sight of him during the confusion of landing and he had to inform his employer of the presence of his enemy in the city without being able to tell him where he was in hiding when m de casalis learned that philippe was at marseilles he felt extremely uneasy not that he feared immediate and direct vengeance but because he imagined the young man would obstinately pursue him and make him disgorge he desired his return to france but on condition that he might know his hiding-place and hand him over to the police the day after his arrival but as he had escaped his vigilance he imagined he was hovering round him and preparing pitfalls beneath his feet he lived for a year in perpetual anxiety he watched marius to no purpose ordered Matthäus to follow him everywhere but failed to find philippe for the two brothers had agreed that they would not meet until a pardon had been granted and they could shake hands without fear besides philippe appeared so different in his coarse garments of a stevedore with his sunburnt hands and face that Matthäus passed several times close to him without recognizing him m de casalis who did not wish to take the police into his confidence without having prepared a certain capture was in despair at his spy's want of success he sent him throughout marseilles daily making him promises that were each time more tempting spurred on by the dread of seeing the steps he knew marius was taking to obtain his brother's pardon successful one day m de casalis who had gone down to the port mingled with a crowd that had assembled round a wounded man he ascertained that it was a stevedore whose foot had been crushed under an enormous case of goods as he went nearer to him he caught sight of another stevedore who was beside the poor fellow giving orders this man's quick movements and loud voice made him start he had only heard philippe's voice once at the time of the trial and it had ever since been ringing in his ears he returned home in all haste and calling Matthäus gave him detailed instructions he was to make sure of this man's identity to follow him for two or three days so as to ascertain what his habits were and the places he frequented the pursuit commenced next morning the plan m de casalis had formed was as simple as it was clever he meant to bring down two birds at one shot he wished to kiss his little great nephew he thought he had left him long enough with the cayolles and desired in his turn to have him to find the child and steal him he determined to make use of his father philippe he felt convinced paid frequent visits to his son therefore he had only to follow him to discover where the little one was concealed m de casalis calculated that when he had found out this hiding-place it would be easy to have his enemy arrested and at the same time to take possession of blanche's heir two days later Matthäus informed his employer that the stevedore was indeed philippe cayolle and that every night he went to the cottage of a gardener named ayas at st bernabe who also had charge of a child the ex-deputy understood all and smiled in triumph at what hour does this man go to st bernabe he asked Matthäus. at six o'clock in the evening answered the latter and he remains there until nine o'clock good return here to-morrow at six i will give you your orders 
the next day m de cazalis had a short interview with mathias then they set out for st barnabé which they reached at seven o'clock a couple of gendarmes accompanied them chapter eight open in the name of the law philippe had been leading a monotonous sort of life since he had been hiding at marseilles and his only pleasure consisted in going to kiss his son every evening at st barnabé marius out of prudence had begged him to wait to make these visits until he was free for he felt that it would have been better for father and son to be separated until the time came when they could see each other without danger to either but he had had to give way to his brother's urgent entreaties and he tranquillized his mind by thinking m de cazalis must be unaware of the presence of philippe and his son at marseilles the condemned man who visited no one not even marius went every evening to the gardener's cottage and there enjoyed the only happy hours of his existence generally as soon as he made his appearance the gardener and his wife took advantage of his arrival to set out with the fruit and vegetables they grew for marseilles as he was alone in the house he bolted the door and played with joseph like a child this relieved his mind he forgot the past and present to dream of a happy future when he was there in that old house so quiet and pleasant he forgot he was a condemned man a wretched creature whom a gendarme could lead back handcuffed to the city he fancied himself a peasant a labourer who had cultivated the land all day and was resting at night these serene hours gave him fresh strength and appeased the disagreeable fevers that sometimes racked his frame no one would have recognised in this bowed down and aged looking man watching over a child like a devoted wet-nurse the gay and wild young dandy with whose amorous adventures all marseilles had been busy a few years before ah misfortune is a hard school on the evening when m de cazalis and mathias went to st barnabé accompanied by two gendarmes philippe had reached the cottage as usual at about six o'clock the gardener and his wife were waiting to take a cartload of grapes to marseilles as soon as he was alone he withdrew into the room on the ground floor and shut himself up little joseph was not in a mood for play he had been running all day among the vines and had fallen asleep on a sort of old sofa with smiling lips all stained with the purple juice of the grape philippe moved about on tiptoe so as not to disturb his slumber and ended by seating himself opposite to him and watching him sleep in the undefined glimmer of the falling twilight he remained in that position for nearly an hour silent and motionless listening to the child's light breathing and finding immense delight in gazing on him two great tears which he did not feel trickled down his cheeks as he sat there lost in tender ecstasy he heard a sudden knock at the door and it seemed to him as if hands had fallen on his shoulders to arrest him the violent resounding blows drew him from his dream he returned from his wanderings to his mother earth and passed from his oblivious serenity to that terror of every moment of his life there behind the door were the gendarmes half erect he listened firmly determined not to open he was in the habit of closing the door every evening to make believe the house was empty little joseph continued to sleep rosy and smiling the blows redoubled but the condemned man now observed that they were dealt by a weak and impatient hand at the same moment he heard the suffocating voice of a woman stammering out in terror open open quickly for the love of god he seemed to recognize the voice and drew back the bolts fine dashed inside at a bound out of breath and fainting and quickly closed the door after her then for a minute she stood gasping with her hands pressed against her heart and unable to speak philippe gazed on her with astonishment she had never before been to the cottage at that hour and something very serious must have happened for her to have risked such a visit which was compromising for her what is the matter he inquired they are there answered fine heaving a great sigh i saw them on the road and began running across country to get here before them who do you mean she stared at him as if surprised at his inquiry ah yes she answered you don't know i came to tell you they were going to arrest you this evening arrest me this evening exclaimed the young man drawing himself up in a passion this afternoon continued the former flower-girl marius ascertained by providential chance that m de cazalis had applied for two gendarmes to make an arrest near st barnabé always always that man then marius who came home mad with grief sent me off here to take the child and beg you to fly philippe made a step towards the door hey no exclaimed the young woman in despair it is too late now 
i have not come in time i tell you they are there sobbing she seated herself on a chair near little joseph and watched him sleeping feeling quite broken down philippe looked round the room in search of an issue and no means of safety he murmured ah i prefer to risk all give me the child night is falling and i shall perhaps have time to escape he stooped down to take joseph when fine seized hold of his hands making an energetic sign to him to listen then in the terrible silence they heard the sound of footsteps before the house and almost at the same moment the stalks of muskets came in contact with the door whilst a stern voice shouted open in the name of the law philippe turned ghastly pale and slid down on the sofa beside his son all is lost he murmured don't open said fine in an undertone marius impressed upon me in case you were unable to fly that you were to put as many impediments as possible to your arrest so as to gain time why did he not come himself i don't know he did not tell me what his plans were he ran off on his side while i took a fly to get here he didn't tell you if you would come and give us assistance no i repeat he is mad with grief i only heard him murmur i hope to heaven i may succeed at that moment the stalks of the muskets were heard knocking more violently at the door and the terrifying cry resounded open in the name of the law fine placed her finger on her lips to tell philippe to preserve absolute silence each blow each word made them start and increase their alarm little joseph continued sleeping between them but in an uneasy and agitated slumber the gendarme had already been knocking and shouting for five minutes and in the end one of them said to m de casalis that the cottage appeared empty and they had no power to burst open the door if we were sure your man was inside he added we would soon send the lock flying but we cannot run the risk of such a thing with the chance of not finding him there the man is certainly there exclaimed Mathias. i saw him enter i will answer for everything added m de casalis i'd be responsible for what you do the two gendarmes shook their heads knowing perfectly well that they alone would be punished if they broke into a house they only had orders to arrest the person pointed out to them and were not inclined to go beyond their instructions m de casalis was in despair at their irresolution and at seeing them unwilling to proceed any further when a voice was heard inside the dwelling do you hear he said you can see the house is not empty and that our man is within it was little joseph who had just opened his eyes frightened at finding himself in the dark and at the sound of loud voices he had burst out crying fine in alarm had endeavoured in vain to quiet him with kisses but unsuccessfully the son betrayed the father the gendarme knocked again and shouted out if you don't open we'll burst in the door at the violent blows from the stalks of the muskets against the wood philippe understood that the door would not resist for very long he got up and lit the lamp no longer afraid of the light betraying him joseph terrified by the battering outside which shook the whole house screamed louder than ever and fine who had risen and was nursing him in her arms walked backwards and forwards in despair powerless to calm him oh let him cry philippe said to her they know i am here now and he went and kissed his child murmuring in a broken voice poor little darling as he looked at him his eyes were filled with great tears when he had kissed him a last time he quickly advanced towards the door fine stopped him what are you going to open to them she inquired in agony eh hey, yes he answered don't you hear the wood's giving way the lock's ready to fly off a yes may return at any moment and besides now that flight is impossible i won't have the door damaged any further for pity's sake wait a little longer let us gain time gain time why isn't it all up no i have faith in marius he impressed on me to put as many obstacles as possible in the way of your arrest and i implore you to conform to his entreaty it is a question of your own safety philippe shook his head they will make me pay dearly for every minute's resistance he said it's better not to struggle uselessly fine saw that despair had transformed him into a coward and she knew not what to say to instil energy into him all at once she had an idea but she exclaimed what will become of joseph as soon as you are arrested these men will take him the young man who already had a hand almost on a bolt turned round pale and trembling and returned to fine side 
didn't you tell me casalis was there with the gendarme he inquired yes she answered he turned very pale again and stammered out in a choking voice oh i understand it all now wretched egotist that i am i was only thinking of my own safety and my child was in greater danger than myself you are right they only come to arrest me here in order to steal joseph what is there to be done good heavens at that moment such a violent blow was given to the door that the wood cracked as if it were about to split in two and philippe gazed round about him bewildered no issue he continued and in a few moments the door will be broken in what can be done good heavens to escape them the blows became more and more redoubtable one felt that the gendarmes were becoming furious at the long resistance philippe remained for a few seconds with his head between his hands trying to think to discover a means of escape then in a low and rapid voice he said i am of your opinion we must try and gain time marius has always been my guardian angel let us barricade the door with the furniture exclaimed the young woman no that's not advisable open resistance will only hasten on events what are you going to do then open the door and give myself up but before doing so you must run to the loft with joseph and hide yourself as well as possible in the meanwhile i will arrange to make the details of my arrest last as long as i can so as to give my brother time to help us and if they take you away at once and if i am left at the mercy of these men then everything will indeed be against us however there is no time to argue and there is no choice do you hear the door is giving way for love of heaven hurry upstairs and hide yourself well he pushed fine towards the staircase then when she had disappeared in the dark he went and drew back the bolts end of chapters six seven and eight part three chapters nine and ten of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine pardon pardon philippe had taken the precaution of putting out the lamp before opening the door and the gendarmes who were on the point of rushing forward stopped short on the threshold fearing that the darkness might conceal some snare perhaps the trap-door of a cellar was gaping open before them or perhaps they would be attacked from behind as soon as they entered the mass of darkness that expanded before them struck terror into their hearts we must have a light one of them murmured we cannot look for and find a man in this obscurity i have no lucifer matches on me said the other m de casalis was in despair he had not foreseen this new obstacle night was like an impenetrable wall which still separated him from philippe are you afraid he exclaimed and in a moment of anger he gave a push to the gendarme who thus advanced a few steps into the room philippe who had placed himself upright against the wall at the entrance dashed forward passed behind them and found himself outside after having knocked Mateus almost over help the latter yelled the man's escaping the gendarmes were right about face in an instant the young man had come to a standstill at a few yards from the house he could have run away but he thought no longer of himself all his mind was taken up with his child if he had put out the lamp and pretended to make off it was merely to gain time with crossed arms and disdainful bearing he said in a loud voice what do you want with me why have you obliged me to open the door the gendarmes had sprung forward and each had seized him by a wrist let me go he exclaimed with violence you can see very well i am giving myself up voluntarily had i wished to escape i could have been far away by now speak what do you want we have orders to arrest you they said taking their hands off him under the influence of the imperious tone of his voice good he continued i will follow you when you have shown me the warrant concerning me let us go in he entered the room feigning not to see either Mathias or m de casalis when he had relit the lamp and the former deputy and his instrument appeared he turned towards the gendarme and said in a mocking voice do these gentlemen belong to the police the nobleman received the phrase right in the face like a cut from a whip he was conscious of the unworthy part he was playing and the silent anger that had been raging within him burst out what are you waiting for he cried gag the villain pinion him oh rascal so i found you and this time you'll not escape me he was foaming 
he asked for the handcuffs to put them himself on the prisoner the latter looked at him with withering contempt the gendarme had given him the warrant that had been issued against him and he was reading it slowly seeking an excuse for delay he had lit a wax taper he had on him and had slipped into the staircase he was going to execute the orders of m de casalis who had promised him a good reward if he succeeded in stealing little joseph amidst the confusion of philippe's arrest mathias was a prudent man who did nothing lightly for two days he had been studying the habits at the gardener's house he knew that the latter and his wife must be at marseilles and he calculated in his mind that philippe hearing the gendarme had without doubt hidden his son in a room above he expected to find the child alone and to be able to take him without difficulty he inspected the rooms on the first floor and found nothing he burst open a door that was locked searched in every corner and acquired the certitude that joseph was not there then he decided he would go up to the loft the door only closed with a latch Mathias opened it and advanced a few steps on the straw which went up in the heap to the tiles he held the taper high looked from a distance in all the corners not daring to advance for fear of setting fire to the place he could find nothing there was a quantity of things in the place impossible to describe in detail old caved-in barrels agricultural implements of no further utility refuse without a name encumbering the flooring and throwing great dark shadows here and there Mathias thought that philippe could not have hidden his son among all this rubbish covered with dust and cobwebs and did not pursue his search further but returned to the first floor where he made another minute inspection he opened the articles of furniture pulled up the curtains looked everywhere there was no child then he sat down and began to think the rascal was in the habit of reasoning on all occasions and of always acting in accordance with the strict laws of logic his reasoning was short and his conclusion unanswerable he had heard the child cry therefore he must be in the house if he was not to be found on the first floor he must naturally be in the loft he had no doubt made an imperfect search he returned to the loft as soon as he entered he placed his taper on an old watering-pot so as not to set fire to anything he had thought for a moment of lighting the straw at the risk of burning the place down the child was there for sure and he had a vague idea that m de casalis would be delighted at the poor little creature's death he had only to let the taper fall and blanche's air would be roasted but he was afraid of displaying too much zeal of going beyond his instructions his master had asked for the child alive and he couldn't decently take it to him dead he began to search in the straw to rummage among the old barrels he proceeded slowly making sure no corner escaped him expecting at every moment to put his hand on a warm body the taper placed on the watering-pot cast a yellow vacillating light over the loft and afforded him very poor assistance in his search when he had reached the end of the loft he suddenly stopped hearing the sound of restrained breathing he smiled triumphantly the noise came from a sort of buttress formed by trusses of hay piled up at some distance from the wall Mathias stretched forward his head and hands but when he had cast a glance into the hiding-place he brought his hands down beside him in surprise fine had suddenly risen up before him holding little joseph against her bosom the child was fast asleep and smiling in his slumber for nearly a quarter of an hour the young girl had been listening to the smothered tread of Mathias, and during that time had been a prey to most terrible anxiety she almost betrayed herself when he appeared in the loft the first time then when he went down she breathed thinking herself saved and there he was back again and had discovered her she was lost he was about to tear joseph from her arms erect all of a tremor determined she would sooner be assassinated than part with the child she stared him in the face Mathias was at first stupefied he did not expect to find this young woman whom he did not know and who appeared to be the child's mother then the wretch gave a smile of ill omen after all he preferred to have to deal with this young woman than with philippe with a push he would tumble her over on the hay and easily take the child from her fine no doubt read his thoughts in his eyes for she put her back against the wall and stiffened her legs ready for the struggle they did not exchange a word the taper was dimly burning he stretched out his hand she closed her eyes thinking herself already dead when a sound increasing as it proceeded rose from the room where philippe was still with the gendarme 
a well-beloved voice which the young woman recognized was crying pardon pardon amidst outbursts of joy and triumph fine felt her courage return do you hear she asked Mathias. heaven has come to our assistance it's for you rascal that the gendarmes have brought the handcuffs Mathias, in alarm forgot fine and the child thinking only of his safety he ran to the door of the loft and listened then he began thinking where he could fly to in case things took an unfavourable turn down below philippe after reading the warrant for his arrest had to give himself up to the gendarme he succeeded however in delaying his departure under pretence that he could not quit the gardener's house without leaving him a few words of explanation the truth was that he had seen Mathias disappear by the staircase and was trembling for fine and his child he counted no longer on marius he simply wanted to await the gardener's return so as not to leave the house at the mercy of m de casalis the gendarme allowed him to write a few lines and then told him he must set out he gazed about him in despair and only saw the ex-deputy who was sneering well exclaimed the latter so you're muzzled you won't carry off any more heiresses you won't cause any more scandal in families ah it'll be a curious sight to see the gallant philippe cayol fastened to the pillory philippe did not answer out of disdain and so as not to be tempted to smack the man in the face since he had been there he feigned to ignore his presence whilst m de casalis insulted him a gendarme put on the handcuffs off we go he said and philippe was obliged to advance towards the door he felt dreadful agony at the throat and almost burst out sobbing just at that moment as the door was open a joyful shout resounded outside and a man walked in repeating pardon pardon it was marius not having been able to get a fly he had run all the way from marseilles he drew a paper from beneath his dusty clothes and presented it to the gendarme this paper announced the pardon which the king had granted to philippe the document had been promised to the condemned man's brother for more than a month and as chance would have it arrived at the very moment when m de casalis was exerting his last vestiges of influence to prevail on the authorities to act if marius had not proceeded at once to st barnabé with fine it was because he wanted to see once more whether the pardon had not come to hand the gendarme read the all-powerful letter and bowed before it their errand was over it only remained for them to withdraw m de casalis with haggard features terrified at this unforeseen issue watched them leave with anger as if they had been working for the liberty of his enemy he was thinking in the folly of his despair whether there was not some means of compelling them to take philippe off to prison in spite of all marius had embraced his brother on entering saying to him you are free heaven be praised i've come in time and philippe had remained for a moment motionless choking not daring to understand then he suddenly darted upstairs he had just thought of the man who had gone up there to rob him of his son Mathias heard the sound of his footsteps in terror understanding that he was threatened with danger he looked rapidly about him for something to assist him in flight hanging from a pulley before the window of the loft which stood wide open was a piece of cord he grasped it at the risk of falling and slid down almost falling on the head of m de casalis who was leaving with an oath on his lips and rage in his heart when the ex-deputy saw Mathias without the child he almost struck him his expedition had entirely failed he had not secured either father or son fine rescued from the brutality of Mathias, hastened downstairs with philippe to the room below and there the two brothers and young woman mad with joy smothered little joseph with kisses now we are strong exclaimed marius we are no longer at the disadvantage of having a criminal sentence hanging over our heads and can work openly for the happiness of this child chapter x the insurrection of february eighteen forty eight the two brothers on awakening the next morning experienced considerable delight of finding themselves together and free of all fear they had brought joseph away with them the evening before after having thanked ayes the gardener and handsomely rewarded him philippe and his son slept at the little lodging of the young married couple 
during the night marius who was very much upset and unable to close his eyes thought out the plan of a new existence and as soon as the family were assembled round the breakfast-table proceeded to explain it come he said let us speak seriously we must decide what we are going to do with this child and what philippe will do philippe at once became grave and attentive he had often thought of the life he would lead when it would be no longer necessary to keep in hiding and he felt it was his duty to work for his son and renounce his ambitious ideas and follies the child continued marius smiling and looking at fine will easily find a mother the young woman was holding little joseph on her knees and encouraging him to eat his bread and milk with all sorts of caresses when she heard what her husband said she exclaimed a mother here she is he was entrusted to me given to me is not that so philippe it's i who am his mother as we have no children i'll take this one and i'll not part with him he will always stay with me and you'll see how fond i shall be of him philippe who was very much affected at these words pressed the hands of the former flower-girl warmly the thought of bringing up his son had caused him much anxiety and he had often inquired of himself how he could attend to a boy of four fine's offer relieved him of his embarrassed position he would not be separated from joseph and the child would have a devoted mother to watch over him the child is provided for continued marius laughing and i will undertake to provide for the father but before we go any further tell me philippe what your ideas are i wish to work replied the young man i want to make you forget my follies and to assure for myself a calm and happy future that is perfect you renounce your dreams of wealth and consent to be a poor fellow like i am yes then i can give you what you want you must cast aside the stevedore's blouse i will offer you a modest position which will enable you to live without being a drag upon any one i accept all in anticipation i confide in you with my eyes closed being sure that whatever you do will conduce to my happiness very well i am going to place you immediately with my employer m martelli for more than six months i have been reserving a post for you there that will bring you in eighteen hundred francs a year believe me my dear brother remain obscure do not seek to bear this way and we will enjoy happy times together the two brothers went to the ship-owner who gave philippe a kind welcome and seemed delighted to assist him by engaging him in his employ my dear marius said he gaily put this young man where you like there is a great deal of work to do here and we require an active and intelligent staff i like those who serve me faithfully marius entrusted his brother with a part of the correspondence which was considerable and from that moment philippe commenced a peaceful existence he passed the daytime at his office and in the evening enjoyed the tranquillity of the home of the young couple taking joseph on his knees and playing with him for hours together fine had been able to rent an extra room on the fourth floor from the landlord and made it comfortable for the young man whose life was in common with that of the young household he lodged and took his meals with his brother never went out and seemed to care for nothing beyond this domestic felicity this peaceful and affectionate life lasted for several weeks and to see such an united and happy family no one would ever have thought that it had been a victim to the most violent commotion a few months before sometimes however philippe's voice took the brief and irritated accents of former days when he thought of m de casalis the fever seized him again and he spoke of making blanche's uncle disgorge we are cowards he said one evening to marius we don't know how to avenge ourselves i ought to go and slap that man in the face and demand my son's fortune marius whose calm and well-balanced mind enabled him to take a more sober view of the position was quite alarmed at his brother's sudden outburst of passion and what good would it do he answered if he were to slap your enemy in the face he would have you imprisoned again that is all but that man's a thief he's keeping money that does not belong to him he's perhaps spending it for his own purposes ah you're a happy fellow marius to be able to think of such things without getting in a rage for my part i feel inclined to wrest this property which by right should go to joseph away from him i beg you not to do any more headstrong things we are living peacefully enough at present do not spoil our happiness then you want me to renounce on behalf of my child his mother's inheritance eh hey, i prefer that you should renounce this inheritance at least for the moment rather than trouble our life again let us remain on the defensive and not attack 
we are too weak and shall be smashed at the first shock i would like to see my son wealthy and powerful i feel ambitious for him if not for myself your son is happy we love him and will bring him up as an honest man believe me he wants nothing there would perhaps be more reason to pity him if you succeeded in making him a rich heir conversations such as these frequently occurred between philippe and marius the latter felt that m de casalis was too powerful to be attacked with any likelihood of success he understood that the former deputy would assume the offensive at the first opportunity and he wished to reserve all his power for the defence his most earnest desire was to make blanche's uncle forget the existence of joseph and philippe besides he was urged by many reasons to preach disinterestedness to his brother he feared that the latter on becoming wealthy would go crazy again what he was dreaming of moreover for his nephew was the same tranquil existence of a clerk as his own and he did not think that he could prepare him a more agreeable future he frequently said to himself this child will be poor and happy as i am he will find a fine who will afford him the same pleasure as i enjoy at the bottom of his heart he had decided that he would never claim a sou from m de casalis when philippe pressed him too much he spoke to him of blanche and said that a scandal would kill that poor girl for m de casalis would not consent to being deprived of several hundreds of thousands of francs without revolutionizing all marseilles it was thus that he restrained his brother and prevented him from making a scene which might have caused irreparable misfortune briefly marius proved to philippe that the time had not arrived to be avenged and claim the inheritance and from that moment the existence of the family was even more peaceful they had only one anxiety they felt m de casalis hovering round them in the dark and they took every precaution to protect little joseph against the attempts they dreaded in this way they reached the commencement of february maris had his mind at ease he was pleased to see his brother put up with an obscure and modest mode of life and believed him for ever cured of his ambitious dreams there was nothing in the young man's conduct to alarm him he was saying to himself that he had overcome his evil genius when all at once philippe took to going out alone and to absenting himself from his office for entire days marius trembled at the thought of their happiness being disturbed he followed his brother in order to ascertain where he went and he learnt that he was a member of a secret society which subject to impulsion coming no doubt from paris was actively at work propagating republican ideas this discovery upset him he was in despair again at seeing his brother compromise himself and supply m de casalis with arms which he might turn to terrible account when he ventured to sermonize the conspirator the latter answered listen i promised you not to be guilty of any follies on my own account but i had no intention in doing so of renouncing my own opinions the people's time has come and i should be a man unworthy of consideration if i were not to labour for what i believe to be the good of all and he added with a smile in future i shall have but one love and her name will be liberty marius endeavoured in vain to keep him at home in the evening beside little joseph he would listen to nothing and the young household were obliged to submit in silence and despair to the ruin of their happiness the truth was that a peaceful life did not suit philippe he had been able to live for two months in bourgeois tranquillity but he now began to feel sick at heart what he required was violent excitement an existence full of danger and agitation and he dashed with delight into the peril offered by a revolution that was imminent he had always been a man of action and an ultra democrat embittered by suffering having to avenge himself of the nobility he accepted the hope of an insurrection with lively joy and so he resumed his blunt manner made himself the leader of a party urged the working classes on blindly to revolt and prepared the indigent population for the barricades that he saw in perspective on friday twenty fifth february a thunderclap burst upon marseilles news came of the overthrow of louis philippe and the proclamation of the republic at paris the city was astounded this population of commercial people who were conservatives by instinct having no care beyond their material interest was entirely devoted to the dynasty of the orleans who for fifteen years had favoured in a large measure the development of commerce and industry the opinion predominating at marseilles was that the best government was that which allows speculators the greatest liberty of action 
consequently the inhabitants were greatly alarmed at the announcement of a crisis which would naturally put a stop to business and bring about numerous bankruptcies by causing the credit on which most of the commercial houses alone existed to be stopped under these circumstances marseilles received news of the republic as a deplorable commercial disaster the city felt wounded at heart in its prosperity by the insurrectional movement at paris the majority were in despair at the idea of losing the five franc pieces they had hoarded up and there were but few who felt a tremor at the word liberty or whom it drew from the heavy slumber of wealth philippe had been too confident when he thought he could sow and develop republican ideas among his fellow townsmen he exerted himself to do so with all the strength of his nature dreaming wide awake and working hard to realize his dreams if he had made a better study of the people among whom he lived if he had possessed the necessary coolness to judge men and things he would have renounced the idea of raising the standard of liberalism and have prudently remained quiet the republican party to tell the truth did not exist there was no connection between the liberal bourgeois class and the people the latter remained on the lowest stage without leaders without any well-defined tendencies and with no courage to act alone the bourgeois class were satisfied with a little reasonable liberty prepared for their use the few drawing-room republicans who uttered their fine phrases here and there were simple babblers who did not understand the modern ideas of the various classes of society and who merely took advantage of the new state of things to make themselves prominent opposed to these weak and disunited republican elements were two powerful camps the legitimists who were laughing in the sleeve at the overthrow of louis philippe hoping to take advantage of the disturbance to seize the reins of power again and the conservatives the crowd of commercial men who clamoured for peace at any cost whoever were the master a legitimate king or an usurper the latter only hoped ardently for one liberty the liberty to earn millions if marseilles had dared it would perhaps have made a counter-revolution compelled to submit to events it confined itself to opposing the new government with sullen reaction it accepted the republic from the first moment with distrust and endeavoured to lessen the effects of the new order of things as much as possible the conservative and legitimist elements still dominated the city and made it a very active centre of opposition at times when philippe was not led away by excitement he could see clearly that he and his would never succeed in making marseilles a republican city and he then experienced great despair and anger for some time he took to journalism but he soon understood that the flaming articles he published were not even read by the frightened swarm of commercial men and that his enthusiasm was thrown away he then saw that action was preferable to journalism one of the measures that made him despair the most was the formation of a national guard selected exclusively among the aristocratic bourgeois of marseilles this national guard was evidently destined to keep the people in check he would have liked to see the poor admitted to its ranks as well as the wealthy so that the guard of the city might be entrusted to a generality of citizens to a body honestly animated with liberal sentiments the people alarmed the conservatives who armed the bourgeois class so as to create an antagonistic feeling between the two and to set one against the other if circumstances permitted it was simply preparing civil war the corporation of stevedores was the only element among the labouring classes that was admitted into the ranks because it was no doubt thought that the members of this corporation who were in the pay as it were of the merchants who employed them would consent to fight against their fellows the other workers the populace whose name alone caused alarm philippe energetically refused to belong to the national guard i shall remain with the people he exclaimed in public if ever they are attacked if their rights are not respected i shall advise them to arm also and will fight with them from friday twenty fifth to tuesday twenty ninth marseilles could not decide on proclaiming the republic the authorities of the former regime remained at their post and the entire city was anxious and ill at ease the prefect and mayor affirmed that they were without news from paris feeling that there was great peril in leaving the power in the hands of the servants of the former king the republicans made several manifestations without effect reaction was already commencing and the conservatives would not abandon the position without being certain there was no further hope monday night was reached thus a multitude of workmen assembled on the canebiere were to march to the town hall in a body with torches in their hands and a flag at their head 
to obtain a formal promise that the new government would be publicly proclaimed on the following morning during these five days of anxiety philippe was in a terrible state of excitement he did not go to his office returned home late quite upset with the violent emotions of the day and brought angry and threatening language into the sad and distressed young household fine and marius gazed on him in despair convinced that he was going to his ruin and unable to stop him at the brink of the precipice End of chapters nine and ten part three chapters eleven and twelve of the mysteries of paris by emile zola translated by ernest alfred Bizzatelli. this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven in which Matthias becomes a republican when m de cazalis's temper had calmed down on the day following his expedition to the cottage of ayes the gardener he was seized with absolute terror he felt himself in the power of his enemies now that philippe had obtained his pardon the cayolles would no doubt track him without pity he allowed matheus to be a witness of his alarm not knowing on whom to vent the rage that his powerlessness aroused within him he overwhelmed his agent with reproaches reviled him and said that if he had not stolen joseph it must be because he was in the pay of marius matheus received the abuse philosophically and shrugged his shoulders very good continue he said impudently call me a villain if that relieves you at heart you know i am devoted to you because you pay me far more liberally than those beggars cayolle could ever do instead of getting irritable it would be wiser to think over the position and come to a decision the rascal's self-possession calmed down m de cazalis and he then confided to his accomplice that he had a very good mind to fly and go and live in peace in italy or england it was the simplest and most expeditious way of escaping the annoyances with which he was threatened they would certainly not go and demand the accounts of his guardianship in a foreign country matthias listened to his master and shook his head this idea of running away did not suit his views at all to complete his fortune he required m de cazalis to remain at marseilles so that he might speculate on his fright and get all the money he could out of him he certainly felt that the latter was right in wishing to take to his heels which meant safety but he cared very little about the safety of m de cazalis and did not mind if he compromised him from the moment it was to his interest to launch him into a struggle from which the issue was doubtful but what he desired above everything else was not to lose his pay as a spy he therefore pleaded warmly against flight and he was fortunate enough to find good reasons to support his argument why fly he said have you abandoned the idea of avenging yourself then there is no reason to despair your enemies are trembling before you and will never dare attack you openly there are a thousand things that bind them to silence come you are very wrong to be alarmed in your place i would remain and conquer i would openly assume the offensive those idiots are sure to make a mistake we will take advantage of everything and the time will come when we shall have them again in our power you have accused me of clumsiness because i did not succeed in bringing you the little one i am not clumsy and i have a return match to play on the word of an honest man you shall have the child the deuce acting together we can make anything we engage in succeed he spoke at length cleverly appealed to his employer's pride and vengeance and ended by persuading him to remain and continue the struggle then there was a long conference between them before doing anything m de cazalis desired matheus to make an effort with blanche he was to endeavour to obtain her signature to various documents which would deprive her son of a large part of his inheritance he set out on his errand firmly decided not to get anything signed for if he acted in accordance with his master's desire that would simplify matters too much and his services would no longer be required as when the documents were once signed his master could dispense with his assistance he arranged in such a manner that blanche firmly refused her signature m de cazalis was exasperated at this refusal and only dreamed of vengeance he spoke of nothing less than having the cayolles knocked on the head it was at that degree of irritation that matthias wished to see him arrive and he took advantage of it to make him give him full powers he then begged him not to meddle in the affair so as not to compromise himself every evening he called and made him a report which was true or false 
he kept him informed of the acts and attitudes of his enemies calming him irritating him according to his requirements and always promising him prompt victory two months passed m de casalis was beginning to get impatient saying the cayolles were too circumspect and that such people would never make a mistake when one evening mathias entered his drawing-room rubbing his hands with the air of a conqueror what's the news inquired the ex-deputy impatiently of his accomplice mathias did not answer immediately he had seated himself comfortably in an armchair and with his hands crossed over his stomach sat blinking his eyes with a sanctimonious air this lackey treated the illustrious descendant of the casalis as an equal what do you think of the republic he abruptly inquired of his master in a bantering tone it's a fine invention of the human mind is it not the master shrugged his shoulders he tolerated this rascal's impudence and the latter took secret delight in wounding him you are aware that the monarchy is dead and buried continued the tattered amelian in the same bantering tone we have been citizens for the last twenty-four hours and i feel inclined to address you in the second person m de casalis had been following political events during the last few months with much indifference he had learned on the previous evening of the overthrow of louis philippe without even paying attention to the news formerly when he was deputy in the opposition ranks and sought to shake his throne which the people had just upset he would have applauded at the event free afterwards to discover the most rapid way of muzzling the rabble which was the name he generally gave to the working classes but at the present moment his only anxiety consisted in discovering a means by which he could retain possession of his niece's fortune so as to be able to devour it with impunity when he heard mateus say he felt inclined to address him in the second person he nevertheless made a movement of disgust no joking he said dryly come what news have you mateus maintained his insolent attitude hey hey he answered with a sneer how sharply you speak to your brothers for you are aware that we are all brothers it's written on the flags oh what a fine thing the republic is come to the point what do you know where have you been i know that we shall perhaps be throwing up barricades one of these days and i come from the workers club of which i am one of the most popular members it is matter for regret sir that your opinions debar you from listening to me i delivered a speech this morning against the legitimists which was approved by every one present but for the matter of that i can give you proof of my eloquence and mathias rising stood upright one hand on his heart and the other extended in front of him like a man about to speak m de casalis understood that his worthy associate had some good news to tell him and that he was making him pay for that news by amusing himself at his expense he belonged to this man and he saw he would be compelled to accept his sneers until it pleased him to say all by cowardice and to flatter this rascal who played with him as with a prey he lowered himself to the point of laughing at his clownish grimaces hoping by so doing to make him speak out sooner you certainly must make a capital speaker he said to him with a smile mathias had kept in the same position trying to recall the sentences of his speech then he let himself fall into the armchair crossed his legs threw himself back and continued still sneering i can't remember it it was very fine i said the legitimists were rascals i even think i mentioned your name and suggested hanging you at the first opportunity they applauded i must you understand take care of my popularity he laughed displaying his wolfish teeth m de casalis who was becoming exasperated at the scoundrel's familiarity walked up and down the room making the greatest efforts not to burst out in anger the other felt delicious delight at his rage remained silent for a moment and when he saw it would be imprudent to make fun any longer he continued in a bantering tone by the way i forgot to tell you that m philippe cayol is my colleague at the workers club m de casalis came to a standstill at last he murmured yes continued mathias slowly m philippe cayol is a very warm republican and i pride myself on being his disciple i humbly confess to you that his speeches are of a much more fervent democratic character than mine that young man will certainly save the country if it ever stands in need of being saved ah that simpleton has flung himself into the liberal movement body and soul he is one of the leaders of the red party 
the working men worship him because he shows no pride with them and because he has the simplicity to tell them in good faith that the people are king and that the poor are going to take the place of the nobility and wealthy m de casalis was beaming he is compromising himself we have him in our grip he exclaimed Mateus feigned to be scandalized what he is compromising himself he answered say he is a hero a glorious child of the republic in ten years the people conquerors of kings will erect altars to him i experienced such enthusiasm at his speeches that i suddenly felt the material of a republican in me he rose and with clownish majesty continued citizens you see in me a republican look at me observe how a republican is made we are only a few hundred at marseilles but we are sufficient to bring about the salvation of humanity as for myself i am full of zeal in his turn he strode up and down the room here is what i have already accomplished in favour of the republic he continued i have taken m philippe cayolle as a model and in order to inspire my mind with his thoughts i have followed him step by step we were both members of a secret society then i arranged to be admitted to the workers club at the same time as he was each time he speaks there i applaud him intoxicate him with enthusiasm that is my own poor way of serving the country i am sure that m philippe cayolle encouraged by me will accomplish great things i understand i understand murmured m de cazalis Mathieus continued declaiming we will raise barricades it is i who insist on it because barricades are necessary to m philippe cayolle's glory the people have laboured enough is it not so the aristocrats must work in their turn a few bullets will set everything in order m philippe cayolle will march at the head of his friends the working men he will lead them on to fortune unless a gendarme takes him by the collar and drags him before the judges at the assizes who will certainly show the bad taste to sentence him to transportation the ex-deputy was beside himself with delight the grimaces with which Mathieu's accompanied the speech now amused him he pressed his hands and repeated effusively thanks thanks i will reward you you shall be rich for a moment Mathieu's continued standing in his triumphant attitude then he burst into a peal of laughter hey what think you he exclaimed the trick's done he had the manners of a mountebank about him and was delighted at the scene with which he had accompanied the news he brought at last master and valet seated themselves and talked in an undertone you understand me said the latter we have got m philippe who is behaving like a child trust in me i will make him do something extravagant which he'll pay dearly for but if you follow him step by step he must recognize you eh hey, no he only saw me once in the evening at st bernabe besides i have purchased a wig of a bright red colour which gives me a capital revolutionary appearance ah what simpletons these democrats are my dear master they talk of justice duty equality they have an air of honesty that irritates me i bet they'd massacre me if they were aware i was working for you you will never recompense me sufficiently largely for the sacrifice i am making and consenting to pass for one of theirs and if the liberal party wins the day asked m de cazalis who had been thinking Mathieus looked at his master stupefied what do you say he answered twitting him then do you fancy they are so fond as all that of the republic at marseilles listen to this whatever happens the liberals will be beaten in this good city have no fear if cayolle can be caught in some fray his business will be settled before a fortnight's over our merchants will have had enough of liberty and will want to strangle all those who serve it out to them the ex-deputy remembered the manoeuvres that had brought about his election and could not repress a smile his acolyte was right where money is all-powerful republican ideas do not flourish i have no need continued Mathieu's, to expose my entire plan to you remain quiet and i feel sure of handing father and son over to you we will begin the expedition to st bernabe again but in a more intelligent manner and as his master renewed his thanks he bluntly added but look here you must not have me collared with the other republicans to get rid of me 
i am compromising myself and require a guarantee write me a letter instructing me to watch over philippe Cayolle. in that way you become my accomplice i will return you that letter in an exchange for a sum of money which we will arrange between us in payment for my services m de cazalis consented to everything he could not for the matter of that do otherwise and he felt he would always have power over matthias on account of the money the latter before leaving urged him to remain quiet in his hotel as he wished to act alone chapter twelve the republic at marseilles the republic was at last solemnly proclaimed on the canebiere on the dull wet morning of tuesday february twenty ninth at the very moment when the former authorities were divesting themselves of office the temporary commissary that paris had sent to marseilles was descending the rue d'aix in a post-chaise thus by a singular chance during the march past of the troops and the national guard the representatives of overthrown royalty and of the young republic were brought face to face that day was a grand and solemn one for philippe his fondest hopes were realized for a moment he had feared that the monarchy might be followed by a regency the length of time that the prefect and mayor of marseilles had taken to recognize the revolution had made him think that the struggle at paris had perhaps not been decisive they were gaining time they were no doubt hoping for a reaction that was not forthcoming when he heard the new government publicly proclaimed it seemed to him that the people had just won a grand victory and he firmly believed that the hour of the great democratic cause had arrived but the hopes the young man had formed on hearing those big words liberty equality fraternity pronounced were not long in being dispelled by facts he fell down from the heights of his humanitarian dreams to the reality of human passions and interests this terrible fall exasperated him and drove him to extreme resolutions he had had the simplicity to imagine that the proclamation of the republic would be followed by a great movement which would carry all the city along with it into a liberal channel he was painfully surprised when he perceived that the superior authorities urged on no doubt by the fatality of circumstances were obliged to make concessions to the reaction the conservatives the legitimists themselves remained in a measure the masters at marseilles creatures of their own occupied official posts and secretly directed public affairs in a word the city tolerated the new government rather than accepted it when the republicans understood that they were not victorious they wished at least to dispatch representatives to paris who would be firmly resolved to defend the people's interests and so the ensuing elections absorbed all their power of action they felt how precious a victory would be to them and ardently hoped that the deputies would be chosen from their ranks alone these elections were to be held on april twenty third during the three weeks preceding that date philippe took an active part in the work and manoeuvres of the different clubs the democratic party had suffered a preliminary check on the occasion of the appointment of a municipal commission on which men hostile to the republic had found seats notwithstanding the desire openly expressed by the republicans that they should be excluded and so the clubs in order not to be beaten a second time displayed great activity and energy they drew up preliminary lists instructed the people in their political catechism and strained every nerve to make their cause triumph during these three feverish weeks philippe continued to throw dust into his own eyes he forgot what was the real feeling in the city and would not see the formidable reaction that was surrounding the small group of liberals from morn to eve he ran about marseilles encouraging some thanking others and endeavouring to obtain the largest number of votes possible he undertook moreover to sound certain people whom the republicans wished to make their representatives and who by reason of their modesty or from some other cause remained in the background among these was m martelli one morning philippe went to his office where he was now very rarely seen and sent to ask the ship-owner for a short interview m martelli received him at once he understood that it was not as one of his staff that the young man came to pay him a visit he did not allude to his frequent absence but treated him as a friend guessing the nature of the errand that brought him to his presence after one or two commonplace sentences philippe entered frankly into his business i have not seen you for some time at the workers club he said you are a member are you not yes replied the shipowner i go there very rarely i think that such gatherings do but little to advance the affairs of liberalism philippe feigned not to hear your absence is often regretted he continued men like you are precious you were wrong 
one of my colleagues said to me yesterday to have kept in the background on the occasion of the appointment of the municipal commission and now that the elections are drawing near you ought to show yourself and lend all the weight of your honourability to the cause we are defending m martelli did not answer he looked his interlocutor in the face to compel him to make his proposals clear and precise philippe understood him and conformed with good grace we are quite disposed to push your candidature forward he continued why do you not place yourself in the ranks there was a moment's silence during which the shipowner looked grave and sad why he answered slowly because i am certain beforehand to fail allow me to speak to you as a friend as a father you are going to your ruin my son the republic will kill you and you will kill the republic you know what my convictions are you do not doubt i hope that i am ready to spend my blood for the triumph of what is right and true but really we do not find ourselves here in a centre where self-sacrifice can be of use we are vanquished before having fought i thought for a moment of repairing to paris of offering my services to the government of assisting it both personally and with my fortune at marseilles i have my hands tied so i have decided to remain aside for i will not mix in all the dirty business i foresee ahead then you are certain the reaction will win the day yes if all the cities in the provinces are animated by the same ideas as marseilles our republic will last two or three years at the most and we shall then soon have a dictator interrogate facts and they will answer m martelli's grave tone of voice and calm despair produced a most lively impression on philippe who was for a moment conscious of the terrible reality you are perhaps right he answered sadly but if young people had your experience they would cross their arms and that would look cowardly you see it is better to struggle then you refuse to put yourself forward no indeed if the people think they have need of me i will respond to their call whatever happens although i feel certain of not succeeding i do not think i have the right to avoid the requirements of circumstances i will not retire in presence of a repulse from the moment republicans ask me to run the bad chance of that repulse but i will not be mistaken for one of those ambitious creatures who are stirring up the population at present who flatter the republic as they flattered royalty so as to assure their fortune and position i have kept in the dark up to now so as not to be confused with one of those men and i wish it to be clearly understood that if i consent to be a candidate it is because people have asked me and i have solicited nothing m martelli had raised his voice standing up his eyes sparkling he accented each word with vigorous action philippe had also left his seat come you are yourself again he said you will see all will go well i am going to tell our friends at once that you accept their mandate your name will be placed on the preliminary list to-day and it must absolutely come victorious out of the urn you are young replied the shipowner shaking his head you dream with your eyes open ah my poor child liberty is very sick i think we are present at its funeral philippe drew himself up violently well he exclaimed if they kill it we'll take our guns and kill its murderers it will be civil war barricades blood corpses so much the worse he trembled with exasperation m martelli had taken his hands and sought to pacify him if you make barricades he said to him i will go and place myself between your fire and that of the troops blood must not be spilt in the name of brotherhood no no we must have no violence philippe withdrew this interview had filled him with sullen uneasiness the shipowner's calm reason had thrown cold water as it were on his passion internally he was in despair but he continued to busy himself actively with the elections and when the grand day came he almost recovered hope so that the result of the first trial fell upon him like a thunderbolt all m martelli's predictions were accomplished not only was he not named but the reactionary party had a complete victory out of ten deputies elected there were barely three radical republicans the others belonged to the conservative and particularly to the legitimist party from that moment philippe was in a constant state of irritation he saw clearly how useless his efforts were and yet he gave himself up to an ill-fated task that could only lead to misfortune each day the party he supported had to put up with a new defeat 
the reaction increased in power and one newspaper went so far as to openly preach political decentralization to escape what it termed the revolutionary dictatorship of paris the superior authorities were weak and powerless and constantly made concessions if a king had landed on the canebiere he would have been acclaimed by the entire city the republicans protested in vain against the organization of the national guard the companies of which were composed solely of rich bourgeois and consequently of conservatives this organization presented permanent danger of civil war the day the people and the national guard met there would necessarily be a shock philippe in his hours of anger and despair foresaw this fatal meeting and experienced ghastly delight in thinking of the hand-to-hand -hand struggle in the meanwhile he fraternized with the people was at all the banquets and intoxicated himself with rhetoric after the elections he had resigned his post with m martelli so as to be able to live freely in the streets amidst the events of each day he knew not how all this would end but he nursed the vague hope of a battle out of which the people would issue victorious then the republic would triumph and the working men would command in their turn two months passed by and they were in the middle of june fine and marius lived in constant alarm the latter not daring to lecture his brother any more owing to his blunt manner confined himself to watching him on the sly so as to always be ready to save him from the follies he might be guilty of one day as he arrived on the canebiere he found himself face to face with the captain of the national guard who was making the new gold braid on his uniform dazzle in the sun after a moment he recognized sauvert the former master stevedore was beaming he struck his heel on the pavement in a victorious fashion at times when he glanced at his epaulettes out of the corner of his eye a smile of satisfied vanity hovered round his lips his sword troubled him somewhat by knocking against his calves but he held it leaning his hand on the hilt with rounded arm his uniform fitted him tightly in true military style and if he were bursting in his tunic he was happy to do so for the welfare of his country by the way he walked with his elbows stuck out one could see he saved france at every ten paces you could read on his intensely delighted countenance childlike joy at being dressed up as a soldier and a burning desire to be taken seriously his meeting with marius at first rather embarrassed him he feared the latter might remember the past the time when he frequented the gambling house and that he would make fun at finding him in uniform he looked at him uneasily dreading to see his dignity compromised when he perceived the young man suppressed a slight smile he thought it well to show himself off with all the grace of his rank of officer hey he exclaimed in a military voice brief and resounding hey it's my young friend how are you it's centuries since i saw you ah how many events good heavens how many events he spoke so loud that the passers-by turned round this attention bestowed on his personality flattered him enormously he shook himself in delight producing a clanking sound of steel and cast the reflex of his stripes and epaulettes in the eyes of the crowd as marius pressed his hand without answering he imagined he was confounded by the magnificence of his costume he took his arm with a protecting air and began to walk up the canebiere deigning to give him proofs of friendship hey you stare at me he continued you are surprised to see me in the national guard what could i do they so begged me so implored me that in the end i accepted you understand i would a thousand times sooner live quietly at home but in these difficult times good citizens have duties to perform they had need of me and i could not refuse he lied with the most barefaced self-possession it was he who had begged for the post of captain with joined hands he wanted golden epaulettes on that condition only did he consent to serve the country marius sought for an answer and finding nothing ended by murmuring yes yes we are in difficult times but we are here cried sauvert placing his hand on his sword they will have to pass over our corpses before they can trouble the tranquillity of the land fear nothing cheer up your wives and children the national guard will not betray its mandate he delivered this like a speech learnt by heart marius to put him out of countenance was tempted to ask for news of clairon observe all this population continued sauvert how peaceful what faith it has in our vigilance and courage 
he stopped and continued in his old tone of naivete and self-satisfaction what do you think of my uniform haven't i a martial air the epaulettes you know cost me a tremendous lot of money you look capital answered marius and i confess your unexpected appearance produced great impression on me and what are your opinions sauvert appeared full of importance my opinions he repeated thinking what that could mean ah yes what i think of the republic that's it is it not well i think the republic is an excellent thing only order you understand the national guard was formed to preserve order order i insist on that he swung his body about triumphant at having been able to find he had an opinion at the bottom of his heart he felt esteem for the republic which had given him epaulettes but he had been told that if the republicans were victorious they would rob him of his money and therefore he detested the republicans these contradictory sentiments had to get on together as best they could but for the matter of that he never asked himself what his convictions were he went a little way further with marius and then left him with the remark uttered with much importance that his duty called him elsewhere but it was only a sham departure he turned on his heels and came back to whisper to the young man in a confidential tone ah oh, i forgot just tell your brother that he compromises himself with that lot of tattered amalians whom he drags along with him everywhere advise him to go up the rabble and obtain a captain's commission like me it's more prudent and as marius without replying pressed his hand to thank him he added like the good fellow he was at heart if i can be of any use to you in any row count on me i feel just as much inclined to serve my friends as my country i am at your service you understand he was no longer acting marius thanked him again and they parted the best friends in the world in the evening the young man spoke to fine and his brother of the meeting and amused them by a descriptive account of the triumphant attitude of the former master stevedore but at last philippe became irritated and it's to such men as this that the tranquillity of the city is entrusted he exclaimed these gentlemen are well dressed these gentlemen play at soldiers ah let them beware they may perhaps be compelled to perform their part seriously the people are tired of their tomfoolery and vanity hold your tongue said marius severely these men may be ridiculous but one doesn't kill one's fellow-countrymen philippe rose and continued with greater violence the country is not with them it is the workmen the workers who are the country the bourgeois have guns the people have none the people are being guarded musket to the shoulder like wild beasts well one of these days the beasts will show their teeth and devour their guardians that's all and he abruptly went upstairs to his room End of chapters eleven and twelve